Your Excellency, thank you so much for joining CNBC. I just want to kick off by giving you an opportunity to set the scene. We talked a lot about net zero today at the conference. What are the goals that Egypt has going into the COP? There are quite a large number of countries uh, that has the same position, where we all believe in the uh, uh, Paris agreements and we all believe in uh, the energy transition definitely and we all believe that we need to have a clean planet with a better life for our kids and grandkids. However, we need also to be realistic and uh, really um, practical and to try to find out solutions um, with proper time. Proper time, then we will need to talk about finance and technology. So this is, in a nutshell, what are our priorities in the COP27. In terms of financing deals like this, it's becoming more and more difficult, really, to find partners to do that. And that's a result of activist investors. It's a result, obviously, of the pension funds. Um, the private equity groups have to answer uh, for the things that they do in terms of putting money forward for massive projects. Not to say those projects aren't necessary, but it's getting harder and harder to access financing. How do you see that evolving for Egypt? We have to, uh, uh, to send a signal that it is becoming very critical, very sensitive. Uh, we are in danger, and if we continue doing like that, uh, of putting pressure on the finance and financing agencies and other fin uh, investment banks, um, I would say that these uh, actions will really harm um, and will enlarge the problem where, uh, that we are in now. Um, and I think how I'm saying that, because we have seen the prices are jumping and we have seen a $95 a barrel and more than $30 uh, a million um, BTU of uh, natural gas or LNG. So if this pace would continue, we will have really a crisis. And I mean, globally, and this definitely is uh, harming the, uh, it will put the world into recession, to inflation. It has really a, a bad and negative impact. Um, I think then in parallel, and this is things that uh, we would uh, explore, and perhaps we started already to talk about with other companies and other financial tools or, or, or arms that we would need to look and to think of other ways of financing, uh, non-traditional ways of financing, uh, issue bonds, um, uh, issue shares. I, I, I don't know. I mean, but You're there are, have to get we have to get creative. And I think as long as the world needs energy, definitely. Uh, you will find investors and uh, people who would like to invest. So, uh, so the structure, the financing structure will change. Uh, we will not go as we used to go uh, traditionally. What does it mean to you now to see oil hitting $90 a barrel? It is uh, definitely uh, something that we would not desire, would not like. And how would that impact? This is the question, definitely. I would just want to tell you that because we had taken good actions since 2016, uh, since we started our economic reforms, so and we have made a big, important program uh, with the IMF, uh, out of which we were able to find a solution at the end of the program, which is introducing the fuel indexation. The fuel indexation mechanism allows us to uh, change the prices, so you will take um, a system on a quarterly basis to review the prices. So in other words, you pass through the cost to the uh, consumer. Uh, so practically, the government will not be uh, hit, however, the consumer, uh, is the consumer is there. That it will be the uh, the people who will be hurt. And your and fuel income's not rising to meet that. You've got people, frankly, correct. unable to afford to go to work. Correct. How do you answer them as a government? So this is how we we need to work, and 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 this is a quite a quite good question, and this is uh, where the government acts uh, responsibly and uh, immediately 
in these cases, and this is happening, um, to enlarge the uh, safety, uh, social safety nets framework and uh, really uh, start uh, targeting the vulnerable people and the, uh, the people who are uh, in more need of uh, support. This is from one side. From the other side, perhaps I was talking about it today also in my panel that since we are talking about uh, a resource for energy, so we enjoy good uh, natural gas. So in this case, enlarge the, uh, the base consumption of natural gas, which is cheaper, affordable, and uh, uh, locally uh, produced. So when I said I say this, so we connect more households rather than having their LPG bottles, which is part of liquefied petroleum gas. So it is part of what the prices of oil would uh, get increased. So in lieu of that, we are introducing more of uh, natural gas connections to households. What's the penetration right there in terms of the population? Just the number. Uh, 1.2 million household per year. Uh, we have reached a number of 13.5 million household connected already. And this means that we are talking about more than uh, 55 to 58 million uh, people that are connected to natural gas. And, and when we say 58 million people uh, in a population of uh, more than 100 million, but uh, this means, and these are families, so uh, not necessarily that... Uh, so there are, in these numbers, kids, so uh, in the balance of the 100 million. So, I mean, right. we have good penetration, and I think that we will we'll cover the balance in the coming three years. So we will not have uh, uh, anyone whom we can connect with natural gas, even to uh, the villages and uh, towns. So you're and, hitting the rural population uh, we're, as well. We're, exactly. So we are going there in a big project called Decent Life yeah. that the president is uh, uh, sponsoring uh, that uh, will have in the coming three years a full coverage of more than uh, 4,000 uh, small villages. There's a phrase in the United States that I know you're aware of. It's the economy, stupid. And one of the things that is being discussed right now is whether or not the current administration, President Biden, is going to survive um, into a second term and whether or not his party, the Democrats, are actually going to win their seats back and gain more seats potentially in the midterms. And all of that is revolving around inflation and particularly energy costs. High gas prices up about 65 percent over the last yeah. year. So in the United States and in Europe, there are political consequences to high energy prices. Would you say the same about Egypt? Because it, certain, it, it certainly hits the bottom line for consumers here. Uh, the government here uh, tried to do these efforts in order to make sure that it reaches the vulnerable people. And um, so in continuation to that, I wanted just to add to my example uh, is the uh, fuel for running our gasoline for cars. So instead of that now, we are also expanding in what we have in CNG, so compressed natural gas also. So we are also converting a lot of cars to CNG. And it is beginning to, uh, not beginning, it's, we have seen the raise in conversions over the last three years now, with the big difference in the two prices between the liter of gasoline and the um, cubic meter of uh, natural gas. It's half price, so people are really, and who are the ones who are more converting cars? Are the people who has got uh, taxi drivers, small vehicles, small family, uh, uh, the um, small uh, minibuses, uh, people who, who live uh, uh, their, uh, their, their, they earn their money from their car and from driving and having this, or the small uh, young uh, starting uh, their life uh, couples, uh, so whom they need any additional income mm -hmm. uh, to save. Accordingly, uh, uh, such efforts, and, and, and you cannot imagine 
So you're doing all of this as a we're buffer. We're doing as a government is exactly as a buffer. That, that. This is true. This is true. But and I, we, would we you are, say that there will be a political consequence to higher prices that there could be in Egypt? I, I, for the time being, I, will, I, I do not see it, and uh, I don't see that we have this uh, yet. And part of the good uh, leadership that we have is uh, the transparency and the communication and uh, the engagement and uh, the timely uh, engagement with people. So uh, You feel like you got ahead of it? Exactly. Okay. Yeah. When you think about what happens next within the sphere of investment and the creation of a, a, a gas export economy, timeline that for me. Egypt currently is a net exporter. This is number one. But how big? This is something. Uh, it's going. It is relative. Uh, we cannot compare ourselves with uh, Qatar, with uh, the USA, for, or the, or Russia, or Australia in LNG. But for the East Mediterranean, it is a meaningful uh, volume, uh, and not necessarily, as I said before, that uh, it would depend only on the exports of gas of Egypt or of the Egyptian gas, but it could also be the way, and this is the case currently, from the Israeli gas, from the Cypriot gas future, near future, and any other new discoveries in the East Mediterranean basin, which is the idea of having this forum, uh, because we just wanted to demonstrate and to prove the concept that we can work together peacefully and for the welfare and the well-being of the people there. So. So energy security means political security Definitely, well. definitely, definitely. Yeah. And perhaps uh, you've seen today, Hadley, who were there as my guests. You've seen the Jordanian minister, the Emirati minister, the Israeli minister. So we have seen them all together, the Cypriot minister. So they are all around yeah. and uh, they are all uh, happy. And uh, I think that... Uh, uh, How much easier did the Abraham Accords make your life as a minister with the ability to actually put them all on that stage together and have that open dialogue with a member of OPEC? Th this is true, but I have to tell you, and proudly being Egyptian, that uh, it is uh, since the time of President Sadat. Yeah. We were the first Arab nation to have a peace treaty with Israel, and this was in 1979. And uh, so 40 years later, actually more than 40, 42 years later, came Abraham Accord. So we didn't have this uh, uh, problem before, but this definitely uh, is getting things easier and helping. You mm -hmm. are totally right. But we didn't have this complex or this problem because if you recall, actually, uh, President Sadat paid his life. So, uh, I mean, the cost was not cheap. So uh, uh, we had really... Uh, a price to pay. You're going to be hosting COP27. It's a very exciting time for Egypt. How big a part of his vision is getting to net zero? I would say reducing carbon emissions. I would say uh, uh, having uh, a better transition, energy transition. Um, carbon neutrality, we haven't yet reached the date. We haven't uh, uh, decided or announced uh, the uh, ultimate date, whether it's going to be 2050 or 2060. Do you think you'll make that announcement at the COP meeting? I, I, I cannot commit. I cannot know exactly, but uh, I think it's in the making anyway. Yeah. It is in the making. So it's a journey, not necessarily the destination. Your Excellency, thank you so much for joining CNBC. Thank you.